In the previous video, you learned how viruses can differ based on the nucleic acids that they have. They also differ between whether they're enveloped or non-enveloped. And what we're going to explore in this viral reproduction video is the two major um, ways that, I guess, viruses exist um, in their hosts. And we'll kind of tie in um, some different characteristics, particularly enveloped versus non-enveloped, and how those actually come to be when looking in viral reproduction. So there's two major ways that viruses reproduce. The first one we'll talk about is lytic growth. And this type of life cycle that viruses have, have a couple of kind of direct steps. Now the image that you see on this slide, we're gonna kind of follow it. You're gonna see this bacteriophage. This is talking about a virus. We use the term bacteriophage to describe a virus that specifically attacks bacteria. That's about it. And then this is showing us a bacterial cell. Now, although we're looking at a bacteriophage and a bacteria cell, this is pretty much the same exact way viruses attack all organisms in this lytic growth phase. So first things first, the virus gets to that organism. So whether it's in a human looking at a human cell, whether it's a, um, I guess, a freestanding or independent bacterial cell, the virus has to land on it and hijack it. And what I mean by hijack it is when this vi virus you know, lands or attaches to its cell, its host cell, what it does is it's going to insert its DNA or RNA. Uh, we're not going to go into the specifics. Well, if it's DNA, what happens? If it's RNA, it's what happens. Just know it inserts its nucleic acid into its host cell. And that nucleic acid does have instructions just like nucleic acids that are in our own personal cells, but the instructions that the virus has are instructions on how to, one, you know, just replicate the DNA in general, but the instructions have the blueprints for the virus proteins. Remember, a virus is essentially a protein shell and nucleic acid. Well, in order to reproduce or make more of it, it needs more of its nucleic acid and it needs more of its protein. Well, the cool thing about life is that proteins are made up of these amino acids, right? And, and it's made using the four same nucleotides of DNA or RNA. And so that viral DNA or that viral RNA can be read by the host cell. The host cell sees it and it's like, oh, hey, we got a new set of instructions. Let's start making whatever these instructions say. The host cell doesn't really have uh, for the most part, the, the knowledge of like, hey, this is a different kind of protein. It just sees instructions and it follows instructions. And so when that virus inserts its nucleic acid, one, that host cell is going to start replicating that nucleic acid. And it's also going to start reading that nucleic acid. It's going to create those proteins um, that that viral nucleic acid says. And so what we're seeing here in this image, so virus lands, virus inserts nucleic acid. That nucleic acid, you don't really see the step, but that nucleic acid is getting copied and the proteins, aka the virus shell, is being created. And so that's what you see in this middle panel. And those viruses are going to start um, forming. So the nucleic acid going into that protein and bam, we have more proteins. Uh, we have more viruses and our cells, that bacterial cell, made it for the virus. Now, now that we have all these viruses, the viruses now want to go back into the environment or thinking about humans and other animals back into the bloodstream or thinking about plants going into the xylem of phloem. They leave the cell. Now, how they leave the cell is going to impact whether it's an enveloped or non-enveloped virus. So in the bottom picture, what we see is here are these viral particles and they're literally lysing the cell. They're breaking open that cellular membrane and escaping. And you notice that this loose virus has no envelope around it. It does not have a plasma membrane around it. It just left that host cell. It is just a non-enveloped virus. The other thing a virus can do, and that's what we see in this pink picture, is the virus gets assembled inside of the cell and it leaves the cell again. It wants to enter the environment. It wants to infect more cells, but it buds off. 
it takes part of the plasma membrane with it until you have, here's that virus capsid, that protein capsid, but it's also surrounded by a plasma membrane. Now, I do want to make it clear, the virus isn't choosing right then and there. You can almost think of different viruses as species, and particular viruses, they part of the way they're able to survive is if that is an envelope virus, that species is always enveloped, it's always going to be enveloped. There's not a choice. If that virus, this one in the pink, if this virus were to leave this cell and something happened where the cellular membrane um, didn't detach property properly or whatever, that virus wouldn't be able to survive. It wouldn't be able to reproduce. So that particular virus species has to have an envelope. Whereas the one down here, the one that's breaking out and lysing this cell, this one would never have an envelope. It's not, it, it didn't choose like, hey guys, let's just not do the envelope this time. No, it's just that part of that organism is there is no envelope. It survives as it is. So that's kind of like the difference uh, between um, an enveloped and a non-enveloped cell. Now here's where you can imagine some differences exist between being enveloped and non-enveloped. So let's take a look at this envelope cell. It has the plasma membrane of its host cell. Meaning if you think about a multicellular organism, we'll use humans as an example, is that an envelope cell can escape the immune system for longer because it's disguised. So imagine this is a virus, um, imagine it's hepatitis, and hepatitis viruses attack liver cells. And as hepatitis attacks and it buds off of these cells, it now has a liver cell plasma membrane around it. So your immune system cells might come around and be like, oh, it's just a liver cell, I'm gonna keep moving. And so that virus can escape detection for a while. Now I say for a while because imagine that hepatitis liver cell goes through your bloodstream and ends up in your pancreas, ends up in your arm, ends up in your heart. Your body is going to, your immune system that's always on, a, a low response, but always on, will see it and be like, whoa, what's a liver cell doing in my heart? And that's when it's going to start triggering like, hey, we've got a problem here. So envelope viruses are not undetectable forever, but they are for a little bit, especially at the beginning of an infection. Now, the benefit of these non-envelope viruses, like you see down here, they can exist in a lot of environments. And this should make sense because they're proteins, just like your hair, right? Your hair can stay in the cold, it can stay in the dry, it can stay in the wet, it can stay in the hot, it can, ex it can live and, and uh, exist in a lot of different environments without dying because it's a protein. The proteins aren't, aren't living cells. Whereas a plasma membrane, like we see in our envelope viruses, well, plasma membranes need to be in an aqueous solution or it dries out. And if it dries out, it, it disassembles. Um, it can't get too hot because it disassembles. Uh, it can, it can, for the most part, it can get cold for the most part. It gets too dry though. It, 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 it breaks apart. It, that plasma membrane is very delicate. And so viruses that have a plasma membrane die a lot easier because if you get rid of that plasma membrane, again, uh, an envelope virus has to have its envelope. There's no existing without it. Whereas these non-enveloped ones, they can survive in all sorts of environments, but the immune system detects them faster. So there's benefits to both enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. Now, where you start getting sick, it depending on the type of virus, your symptoms, your sickness is one of two things, or, or it can be both. One is just a general immune response. When your body detects a foreign invader, whether it's a parasite, whether it's an allergy, so a perceived invader, whether it's a virus, your body's immune system starts kicking in. And we have a lot of different generalized techniques, such as fevers, such as runny noses, that help to try to either denature the virus or the invader or get rid of it out of the body. We also have more localized immune responses that happen as well. And so some of your symptoms is actually just your body activating its different defense protocols to kill that foreign invader. 
The other thing that can cause sickness when it comes to a virus is it depends on where this virus is in your body and what type of cells it's attacking. For example, for either of these types of viruses, whether it's enveloped or non-enveloped, it's going to kill the cell that it was in. Now, if it kills a couple cells, not a big deal. It starts killing hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even millions of cells. Imagine it's killing millions of your liver cells. Well, that's going to start seeing decreased liver function like we see in hepatitis. If it um, is attacking lung cells, you're going to see decreased lung functionality. So that sickness that comes with a viral infection is your immune response as well as the death of cells wherever that virus attacks. So lytic growth is one type of growth that we see with viruses. The other type of life cycle we see is something called lysogenic growth. And I specifically say lysogenic growth first. And what I mean by that, and I'll explain this more here soon, is that lysogenic growth is part of the life cycle, but eventually it will turn into lytic growth. It's just lysogenic happens first before activating into lytic. So in this picture, again, this is looking at a bacteriophage and um, a bacteria cell, but what's happening is very similar to what we see in other organisms. So similarly, the first step is the virus latches onto a cell. It injects its nucleic acid, whether it's DNA or RNA. Now before, what would happen is that DNA or RNA would get copied, the, it would get red and create those viral proteins. But that's not what happens in lysogenic growth. This virus attacks and it integrates its nucleic acid into the host cell. And this, honestly, I find terrifying. I don't know why. Well, I find it even more terrifying because you, whoever is watching this video, you likely have at least one virus that has integrated its DNA with your DNA. And what's even crazier about it is if successful, remember DNA is the same across organisms, right? It's got A's, T's, G's, and C's. It's got a deoxyribose and phosphate backbone. It is the same. So our body's not like, hey, this is a new piece of DNA. Like our body has no way of fighting it because our body has no way of knowing that it's foreign. So what happens is this DNA that's now integrated into your DNA, when that cell divides, when that cell replicates, that DNA is replicated with it. Oh, sorry, I have a runny nose today. It's my immune system fighting something off. So what we have is that when your cell divides and it copies DNA, it copies that viral DNA. When that cell finishes dividing, we now have two cells each with a copy of that viral DNA. And that viral DNA keeps getting copied over and over and over again every time those cells divide. It's a sleeper agent. That's what I think of it as. So this viral DNA is just chilling in your cells and it's waiting. It's waiting. So again, this DNA that was inserted into one cell doesn't just stay in one cell. Every time that cell divides, it will replicate and it passes on to those daughter cells. And nothing happens. It's fine. You don't get sick. Nothing's going on. Essentially, it's dormant or the, the official word is it, we call it latent or latency, uh, particularly in animal cells. That viral DNA just stays there until you're stressed. I don't mean mentally stressed or I don't mean just mentally stressed. Maybe you're sick from something else. Maybe you haven't been getting a lot of sleep. Maybe you are stressed. Maybe you're overworked. Your body has physical responses to stress. And they're not positive ones. So when you're feeling down, this viral DNA is like, huh, their immune system's kind of uh, reduced right now. Perfect time to attack. And so what happens next is those cells that have that viral DNA essentially get activated. That viral DNA gets activated. It's detecting changes in the hormones and the stress levels in your body and says, you know what? This is a great time to now activate and enter the lytic cycle. And again, as a reminder of the lytic cycle, essentially what it's gonna trigger the body to do is make copies of that DNA, to read that DNA, make those viral proteins, and then 
start killing the cells, right? Those viruses emerge from the cells and try to go attack other cells. And so then you're actually getting sick. Your immune system is now kicking in because there's these viral particles uh, all over your body. There's these destroyed cells that are in your body. So the lysogenic phase is essentially just preparing for a massive viral attack later when you're already down. There's a lot of viruses that do this, and we're going to explore that more in class as some examples of viruses that have lysogenic growth. And again, kind of terrifying. Um, some, some of them are pretty common, but still kind of terrifying thinking that your cells are just chilling, just waiting to attack you. Last thing we'll talk about is kind of preventing viruses in humans. We can treat viruses. So let's say you get sick. If you get sick, you might take an antibiotic if you have a bacterial infection, infection, but there's very few antiviral drugs. And this probably makes sense to you because imagine if it's an envelope virus, it's really hard to develop a medicine that's, hey, attack this virus that attacks liver cells. And actually it has a plasma membrane that is my liver cell. Because if you create an antiviral drug against that, that antiviral drug is very likely to attack your good, healthy liver cells in addition to the virus liver cells. If it's an unenveloped virus, and if it's just the protein, well, it's hard to develop uh, medicines that go through that protein. Um, and, and identify that protein, especially because viruses are so small. So antiviral drugs do exist, but they're rare. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard to create medicines that can attack them uh, because of the characteristics they have. So the biggest thing um, is preventing them. There's a lot of ways you can prevent it. I mean, obviously thinking about things like washing your hands, uh, cleaning yourself so that if you have virus particles on you, you're reducing the likelihood of them getting inside of your body. But this is also where vaccines come in. So vaccines, for the most part, are all geared towards viruses. And essentially the goal of a va vaccine is to build your immune system response. So to give you a crash course in your immune system, anytime you get sick with anything, your body fights it. And at the end of your body fighting it, what your body does is it creates these things called memory cells. It's essentially saying, hey, whew, that cold virus, what a doozy, am I right? So what that, <laughs> just like that, and what those memory cells say is like, hey, if we see these kind of proteins on the outside of the cell, if we see this kind of behavior, if we see these red flags, here's how we fought it last time, here's what was successful, so that if your body sees it again, it can mount a really strong immune response much faster. And it might even kill that intruder before you even feel symptoms. You might not feel symptoms at all because your body was able to fight it off before you, before its numbers got too high. Um, yeah, so it's really cool what our body does to try to remember how to fight infections in the future. Now with vaccines, essentially the goal of a vaccine is to, in a controlled environment, get you exposure to that virus your body's immune system still kicks in because it's still a foreign invader. And then your body builds those memory cells. It says, hey, we saw, oh, we saw that flu from that flu vaccine. Oh, that was hard, right? It gave you a fever, got some soreness around there. But I've seen this, and I'm going to remember that I've seen this before, so that if you see that again, we know how to attack it much faster and much stronger. And you might not even get sick at all. Vaccines typically uh, are either part of the virus, so it's going to have um, those unique proteins on it that your body can learn to remember, or it might have the whole virus, but it's inactivated, meaning the nucleic acid has either been um, denatured or has been removed altogether. But again, the point is so that your body just recognize really the outside of that virus, so that if you see it again, your body can fight it off. There's different types of vaccines as well, but by and large, most of them kind of use this type um, of a system to get your body to develop that immune response and that memory. So that's pretty much it for our viral reproduction. Again, there's a lot more intricacies of it that you might explore in other courses. Viruses, when you get sick, it's because they're in a lytic phase. However, some viruses will kind of go into the sleeper phase called lysogenic phase, first. Not all viruses do that. Some viruses do. 
But again, when you are starting to feel sick, it's because whether it was lysogenic or not, it is now currently in a lytic phase. It's, it's killing those cells, potentially stealing its plasma membrane like an envelope virus or not like a non-envelope virus. We can prevent these types of viral attacks, uh, particularly the more potent ones, through vaccines and rely on our body's immune system. They've now had access to seeing what it looked like before.